Words cannot do justice just how interesting the history of football actually is. From the simplest additions of rules and regulations to the creation of entire competitions and events which would shape the footballing landscape for years to come. With this in mind, I thought it was time to look back at the past with fondness and dig up some historic dates like Indiana Jones digging up an old relic or Man City digging up a hole in the ground to put all their excess cash in so the tax man doesn't find it. Welcome to Good Sport Reviews. My name is Lewis and this is 10 important years in footballing history. And if you want to this a historic date for me then please make sure to click subscribe and let's try and reach 3000 by the end of the year number 10 1820 aka folk football in the early 19th century football was used as nothing more than a means of passing time and to release a lot of pent-up violence and aggression the 1820s saw what was described as folk football introduced into the sporting world as rules were finally starting to be introduced to the sport which was played not so much by teams but by mobs and was often an extremely violent pastime with the game being a no holds barred free for all with kicking and handling of the ball allowed. The tradition was often played on Shrove Tuesday as a national holiday event and over the years it became more and more popular amongst so called gentlemen who were able to take part in the event more and more frequently following the popularity rise of it. It may have been a primitive afternoon hobby to begin with but this laid the foundations for the sport that we all know today with the main focus being on progressive play with any means of moving the ball forward being viewed as acceptable. Number 9, 1875, aka the introduction of the crossbar. Do you remember when you were playing football in school and then or in the street and you used to put your school bags and jumpers as goalposts and then someone would shoot and it turned into a massive argument about whether or not it went in? Well, until 1875, this was the norm for football teams as well in the association game. Before this, teams would often use tape or string to determine the border of the top of the goal, but as there was no net in the goal, it was near impossible to determine whether or not a shot actually went in. The crossbar was eventually in this year and following this English teams most notably Sheffield FC and their Scottish counterparts Queen's Park would tour Europe with the trend massively caught on with German teams adopting it from us early on and in 1882 the crossbar was made a mandatory part of association football due in no small part to its success. Number 8, 1878, aka the introduction of floodlights. Prior to 1878, football matches were often faced by the same thing that Man United fans are currently faced with at the moment eternal darkness with football matches often being called off due to players simply being unable to see each other and because of this the floodlights were introduced with the first test of these being at Bramall Lane on several occasions and the early tests didn't go so well with them not being connected to the power grid and instead being operated by the use of batteries and dynamos which were also known as electrical generators this meant that the lights were unreliable and often would short out due to the magnitude of bulbs inside them or they simply didn't cover the whole pitch and sometimes football matches would see the length of of their pitch reduced so players could actually participate in them. Other teams like Darwin and Blackburn experimented with floodlights, so mixed results. But one thing that could not be disputed is how important this year was, as because of this, every major stadium has the supported capacities for fans to enjoy the beautiful game. Number 7, 1887, aka the creation of the football net. As we mentioned earlier on, goals in football were without nets and crossbars for a good few years following the introduction of association football in the late 1820s. However, in 1887, Liverpool-based engineer John Alexander Brody created the original template for the football net with it being made primarily of hemp and its first test was a successful one to say the least with it being used in a friendly match between Preston North End and Hyde, a match which Preston won 26 nil. The reason with this was A, because people didn't know if goals were scored as we previously mentioned, and B, it was also to prevent fans from behind the goal being hit by the kicked footballs. And in 1888, the FA introduced rules for the use of goal nets, and in 1891, football nets were made compulsory for all leagues and FA Cup matches ahead of the 1891-92 season. Number six, 1904, AKA the founding of FIFA. Look, right, you can say what you want about FIFA, that they're a corrupt organization who've been involved in some of the most historic money-based scandals in the timeline of football and have been questioned for their integrity and treatment of humans on a basic level of decency. God, right now I feel like I'm gonna have my skin removed. Please don't quote me. But no one can deny that the founding of FIFA was a milestone in the history of football. With the rapid development of international football in the early 20th century, it became increasingly necessary to have a good 
governing body oversee all the developments in the game. And with this in mind, the Federation Internationale de Football Association was founded in the rear of the headquarters of the Union des Socrates Francais des Sports Athletiques, USFSA, at the Rue Saint Honneur 229 in Paris on the 21st of May 1904, with the first president, Robert Goran, being elected just two years later. This would set the foundation for football becoming an Olympic sport, the computer game, which destroyed millions of controllers across the world, and of course, number five, 1930, AKA the first World Cup. While FIFA's integrity is more questionable than the moon lander, no one can deny that the creation of the World Cup is one of the greatest things in the history of sport. After international football became more popular in the early years of FIFA, they made the decision to add the sport to the Olympics, originally as a demonstration event with no medals awarded for the teams involved. Following the major success of this, they made the decision to create a test tournament in Switzerland in 1906, and allowed the sport to become a major part of the Olympics going forward. And because of this, FIFA president Jules Rimet made the decision to create his own major international footballing tournament and officially the first World Cup took place in Montevideo, Uruguay after the country's incredible success in the 1924 and 1928 Olympics. And it's because of this that Uruguay are allowed to wear four stars on their kit and the World Cup became an iconic part of footballing heritage. Number 4, 1976, aka the start of kit sponsors. Advertisement and football go together nowadays like Simon and Garfunkel or Ten Hag and massive gaps in midfield. But this trend had to start somewhere and this happened in 1976 when Kettering Town FC played a match against Bath City FC with the home side's kit being sponsored by Kettering Tyres following a four-figure negotiation between the club's chief executive Derek Dugan and the company. However, the, the FA soon demanded that the sponsorship be removed following the sponsorship ban of 1972, which Dugan claimed was never actually written down. Following this, kit sponsorship became the norm in England, with Liverpool negotiating the famous Hitachi deal in 1979, and from then on, multiple clubs followed, like Coventry in 1980, with the Talbot sponsorship. Number three, 1911, aka the first numbered jerseys recorded. Numbers on the back of kits have become an important part of football's rich heritage. R9, CR7, Messi 10, Balotelli 99, clearly the best of the four by the way, but they had to start somewhere and this was back in 1911 when Australian sides Sydney Leichhardt and HMS Powerful played in the league and became the first sides to have numbers on the back of their kit so it was easier for fans to know who who was and so the tactics were easier to discuss with the players. Fast forward one year later and kit numbers were made mandatory in New South Wales before the first recorded use of the numbers in England was with English Wanderers, a side consisting of several players from multiple English league clubs played Corinthians at Stamford Bridge, a match which ended 4-2 to the Wanderers after Corinthians returned to the Amateur League following their ban from the F. A. From then on, kit numbers became mandatory across England and beyond, and they remain a vital part of football attire to this day. Number 2, 1958, aka substitutes are allowed. While substitutes were added to the laws of the game in 1958, the use of them actually goes back as far as the 1860s as part of the English public school football game. The original use of the term substitute in football was to describe the replacement of players who failed to turn up for matches as this was something which happened frequently back when football was simply a hobby for people rather than a paying profession. One example of substitutes being used before 1958 was in November of 1875 when Lancelot played Crosshill and one of the Lancelot players suffered an injury which Crosshill saw and gave the home team the chance to make the substitute. Over the years, the number went from 0 to 2 to 3 and now to 5. And thankfully the law of substitutes was introduced as back pre-1958 if a player got injured, the team would simply have to be a player down. I mean, if this happened today, players would be going down every five minutes like dominoes operated by a kid who's down 10 Red Bulls. And number one, 1893, aka the first free figure transfer fee. Now this one can be debated all the live long day, but many people agree that in 1893, Willie Groves was the first player bought for a free figure sum as he made the move from West Bromwich Albion to Aston Villa for bang on 100 pounds, which is around 16,000 pounds in today's market. And following this, Aston Villa were actually fined by the AFA 
amidst allegations that they were illegally poaching the player. Transfer fees have certainly reached ridiculous levels in today's game, with Neymar's transfers to PSG for 200 million euros in 2017, inflating the market to no end and making it so that players like Anthony and Enzo Fernandez are valued at much more than they're worth. But this can all be traced back to this transfer as it set the tone for players' values being judged on performances and showing what direction money in football was actually going. And that's our list. If you are new around here, please make sure to click like and subscribe. Let me know any ideas that you have for videos in the comments down below and let me know what you thought of the video. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you all in the next one.